All right, everybody, welcome to the Unit 3 uh, review. Re recording this to put it on YouTube. And so, like it says at the bottom there, Unit 3 is the Absolutism and Constitutionalism chapter, or unit, I should say, um, talking about you know the two diverging types of government that we're going to be looking at in Western Europe or Europe in general uh, in the 17th century or so. So, uh, let's get started. Like usual, the first one on the key concepts here is that context setting up uh, why we're talking about uh, this issue to begin with, right? What happened in the previous century or two uh, that builds in to this idea or content. So we still, you know, this is a, a gradual thing with the king and nobles, right? And the king of these various countries is almost always gonna be looking to centralize power um, while the nobles are gonna be looking to hold on to that power um, because they don't want to lose it. So you know, this is something that's going to take centuries or uh, coming out of feudalism, right? You don't end an entire uh, way of life or an entire way society is structured uh, just on, you know, just overnight, right? That's going to take a long time, but that is what they are building toward, right? That's what an absolute monarch is building toward, trying to uh, take the power from the nobles and keep it all in the center at the top. So, you know, we are not to nation states yet. We still have issues where absolute monarchs are still going to have to rely on those local power structures. You know, you can't um, paint, you know, with a broad brush here. If you're looking at France and Louis XIV, France is a really big country with a huge population. Um, and north, south, east, west in France, you know, it's not like everyone's going to speak one dialect of French and identify as just, you know, French. And as far as a, an event, even if it is sort of singular and specific, and um, not like a big picture thing, thinking about the Fronde, the noble rebellion um, early in Louis XIV's reign, right? These nobles already feared or already were resentful toward Louis XIII, who had continued to centralize. And then when Louis XIV is a young boy, uh, you know, they see the opportunity perhaps to try to get rid of him because they don't want this continuing centralization. It doesn't work. And then Louis XIV takes that going forward and you know, that becomes his goal, right? I am the state. He is going to become the entity uh, over every possible you know, way of life in France, be that public or private. Okay, 3.2. Um, we have the English Civil War and Glorious Revolution. So the English Civil War is between the crown or the king and parliament. And so England's had parliament for a long time and makes England unique in Europe in that they have a you know check and balance on the power of the executive or the king. So, you know, to sum up and to get to the point quick, right, whenever um, there's a rebellion in Scotland or fear of a rebellion in Scotland, Charles I, Charles I looks to raise an army. Parliament won't approve that army, so he raises his own army. Then Parliament raises his army, or their army, I should say, uh, in opposition. Eventually, Charles I is captured, put on trial. Uh, he is executed. And uh, then you get a monarchicalist uh, England for a little while, right? With the Commonwealth and Oliver Cromwell. Then you have the Stuart Restoration when uh, Charles II returns to England to rule after people get tired of the Commonwealth um, post-monarchy. And that is when you have the religious issues, right? Where Charles II, later James II, um, are Catholics, even if they're not Catholic in name necessarily, but that is when William of Orange and his wife, Mary, William of Orange being the stadtholder uh, in the Netherlands, he is, they are going to take the throne bloodlessly, right? Or essentially bloodlessly, which is why they call it the Glorious Revolution, right? A Protestant king, um, even if he is Dutch, his wife is Protestant and English, they are going to come to England and reassert Protestantism in England. And so the results, um, you know, confirming Protestantism in England for a while and also confirming um, Parliament's rights, Parliament's role in government and society and to kind of delineating for uh, forever what the role of each is, right? No more kind of wishy-washy up for interpretation kind of, excuse me, kind of stuff. 3.3. About the economy, economic changes of the 17th century. So as we get into a market economy, right, it's something that we are in today, um, where no longer is the government or you know pool and 
pull the levers and uh, pull the pulleys and push the buttons on the economy and decide what is made and what isn't and what goes where. Uh, now you have, you know, capitalism where the market decides what's successful and what isn't. And if I have spending money, I decide what I or where I spend that money at. Um, and so whenever we do have this economic freedom, right, you're going to have people who, uh, because they know how to play the game or they're successful or clever or lucky or whatever it is, uh, they're going to find success in that, right? And they are going to want influence and power and government and the way the economy works and how tax codes work and everything else, right? Um, so thinking about that kind of bourgeoisie or burger class, that successful, wealthy middle class, um, you know, they're still commoners and they don't want to uh, be lumped in with the you know masses as it were the uh, continuing colonization of the new world and also in asia and everything else um, you know thinking about the boom that's going to happen in europe all these raw resources um, you know, plantation agriculture and slavery are going to come to europe people are going to want to buy them and that's only going to stimulate that demand right more slaves uh, larger plantations more immigration uh, to the new world and on and on and on that cycle. 3.4, economic development and mercantilism. So just again, that reminder of mercantilism, when governments are looking to maximize exports and minimize and in a perfect world limit imports, that a, you know, it's a um, zero sum game where if I'm having to import things from other countries, you know, I have to pay for those. I'm paying countries um, to, you know, provide thanks to my people, which is not something I'm looking for, right? So in a perfect world, if I'm France or I'm England or I'm put, pushing a mercantilist policy, I'm looking to maximize how many colonies I have. I'm looking to maximize how many resources I can get my hands on because that's that many more things I can make back in my country. And that's what I, then I don't have to buy anything um, or import anything from a foreign country or foreign markets. Looking at consumer culture, right? Where suddenly, uh, maybe not suddenly, but gradually we get into a culture where people have spending money and I am looking to buy things. I'm looking to consume, right? I'm no longer just living on subsistence where I just have the food uh, or I grow the food that I need to survive and I make the handful of sets of clothes I need to survive and on and on. Um, now I'm looking to buy things, right? And that can mean that things are now status symbols. Um, and just think about all the way society has changed when we are consuming and that becomes a norm, right? Where I'm making money um, and I'm getting paid every couple of weeks or whatever, every month here. And, I, and I'm getting paid because I wanna go buy things and I wanna choose, this is what I wanna buy this month and I don't wanna spend money on this. Um, the food, you know, think about the potato, of course, um, going to Ireland and Western Europe, but the European population is gonna boom. You have uh, more food, better nutrition, and again, these effects uh, post-Columbian exchange. A topic we didn't really talk about very much in my class is uh, the Dutch Golden Age of the 1600s, so the Netherlands. And so the Netherlands is a relatively new country. It was controlled by the Spanish Habsburgs. They have a revolution against the Catholic monarchy, and they become a free sovereign nation. And so what makes the Netherlands very unique is it is a republic. They do not have a centralized monarchy. They have nobility, they have stadtholders. Um, that's what William of Orange was, a stadtholder. But they, again, do not have a monarchy, which makes them very unique uh, in Europe because every other country, uh, for the most part, is going to have either a constitutional monarchy or an absolute monarchy, right? And so um, why the Netherlands goes through this golden age, right? So a golden age, of course, is meaning you know, a period in time for a country where everything's flourishing, right? You have uh, high employment, low crime, education is high, art is flourishing, these kinds of things, right? And so countries go through quote unquote golden ages um, where they are very successful. And so the way the Dutch become very successful is through their naval superiority of they have the best shipping technology, they have the best ships, they have the best ports. And there is a period in time where even your other major European powers are hiring uh, Dutch shipping or Dutch boats to ship things for them, right? And so again, there for a, a pretty brief period of time, uh, the Netherlands kind of has a monopoly on shipping and thus they're gonna make a whole lot of money. 
And so when you think about all that money coming into an economy like it is for the Netherlands, uh, standard of living is going to be much higher in the Netherlands for that period of time than it is pretty much everywhere else in Europe. It's a very urbanized country, right? It's not very big uh, area wise. And this is just an example of a country that is not a monarchy finding success, right? And it's a country that found success because it was, you know, kind of on the cutting edge of economy. It was on the cutting edge of, uh, again, naval technology. And so, you know, it's a, an example of that bourgeoisie class maybe leading a country. And there now is evidence that a country doesn't need to have a strong executive or a king or a queen and a dynasty um, in order to be a successful country. Eventually, uh, other countries catch up to the Netherlands as far as naval technology and shipping go, and that golden age is going to end. Uh, and the next slide is we're going to take a look at a piece of art uh, from the Netherlands or from the Dutch golden age. And it's going to be, you know, as art always does, it kind of reflects life at the time. And you're, we're only going to see one painting, but, you know, there are a lot of these paintings that show these very domestic scenes, right? People just in their homes, um, you know, a wife, a husband, and a couple of kids and they're enjoying dinner and they're reading or they're playing with toys on the ground, right? Um, these kind of maybe moments that uh, maybe we take for granted in a modern age, but it's a, it's a new thing in the 1600s to be a family that has that leisure time, that you're off work, you're both at home, everyone's at home and you have time and the money and the ability to sit around and read and enjoy your time together, right? And so, you know, thinking about how that's a new idea for a large class of people, that if for a long time you're a peasant, um, you know, you don't have those moments of tranquility where you're just enjoying uh, your family's company and enjoying your goods and things like that in the privacy of your own nice home. And there is no painting, right? I didn't put that painting on here apparently. Um, but if you do Google Dutch Golden Age paintings, you'll, you'll see what I mean. So uh, 3.6, balance of power. Uh, and that is going to be the you know, as it says there, primary way countries deal with war uh, post 30 years war, post peace of Westphalia. So balance of power, the it's the diplomatic idea of keeping the two sides in Europe relatively even uh, because that would, in theory, stop war, right? So there's always going to be two sides uh, or two factions in Europe. There's never going to be a third random one, really, until maybe when we get, you know, of course, to World War II or something. Um, so the idea becomes if you're a monarch like Louis XIV who has never ending wars and is going to keep Europe, uh, you know, alight with war for decades at a time, other countries might form a coalition, right? And they might, even if they have issues uh, with one another, uh, politically or religiously or, any, or whatever, they might put those prejudices aside for a little while to unite against this common foe, right? And so the balance of power is, even if I hate Spain, and France is trying to uh, take over Spain, I'm still would rather them survive and keep France from getting bigger. So I might help Spain out with that war, right? Because the goal is, um, you know, we don't want this all powerful country uh, destroying all of our enemies because eventually they're gonna come get us, right? And if those sides are even, you know, maybe that does prevent a war. Because if I'm France and I know that if I go to war, every single country in Europe's gonna come after me, uh, you know, I might win, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost a lot to win that war, right? As opposed to if I can just take countries down one at a time because nobody wants to step up for somebody else because they don't like them or because they say that's going to help us down the line, uh, you know, it's just a matter of time before I can kind of divide and conquer and take over the whole continent or take over whatever it is I'm trying to do. So um, something that's been on AP Euro tests in the past and, of course, the key concept is looking at the country of Poland, which is going to disappear here for a while. And Poland uh, is a decentralized country. They have a monarchy, they have a king, but the nobles are very powerful. And so when you look at the kind of juxtaposition there of a decentralized Poland, who is surrounded on three sides by absolute monarchies, uh, Prussia, Austria, and Russia, you know, and those countries couldn't pretty much say what they want to Poland and Poland's going to have to do it because Poland does not have the ability, the bureaucracy to get a big army together, right? Even if they had it as far as numbers go, which, you know, I don't believe they did anyway, um, but I could be incorrect. I'm just guessing on that. But um, 
they don't have the ability to get them all together, right? Because they are all beholden to different nobles or nobles have their different ways of doing things. And so if you're surrounded by three centralized, strong governments, uh, you don't stand much of a chance. So that partition of Poland, it's not a full on war. Poland doesn't fight. It just kind of happens to Poland because there's nothing they can really do about it. Um, so kind of leading into that bottom bullet, armies are, you know, weapons, I should say, are getting more complex and deadlier, right? And the, certainly, while that means wars will be more effective or your armies will be more effective, that means they'll be more expensive. And then you get that cycle beginning to build, right? That if I'm a country, you know, France, Prussia, whatever, and I need to have a army of 400,000 men and X amount of this and X amount of that, that's going to be very, very expensive. And of course, the easiest way to raise those funds is to raise taxes. And the way to enforce taxes to make sure people pay them, you know, a good way to do that is to have a giant army. And so, you know, that cycle starts to build. And if other countries are figuring out, you know, better ways of um, waging war, you get that arms race, right? And maybe it's not so much technology like it is when the United States and the Soviets are, you know, racing to get to space and build bigger and bigger atomic bombs. But it's certainly a, um, you know, a competition effect, right? And I'm not going to let my opponent or my enemy or my rival um, continue to build and build their economy and build their army um, and not do something about it. Okay. So um, absolutist approaches to power. So Louis XIV, right, again, he's, you know, without modern technology, it's not like one guy in Paris or Versailles can sit there and dictate uh, edicts and things to an entire country. So he's using those intendants. And remember, those are non-nobility or non-nobles who would, in theory, right, if I'm an intendant, and I'm still going to be a wealthy, educated person, right? He's not finding uh, me when I'm knee deep in hay and refuse in the barn or anything to go do this job, but I'm not going to be a noble. And so when, it, when I get sent off to some province, um, and who knows where in France, I'm there to govern and to kind of dictate things the way Louis XIV would if he were there, right? I'm a carbon copy of Louis XIV as far as his politics and demands go. And the reason he would pick somebody who is not nobility is because if I was chosen for that job, you know, it's a pretty sweet job. I'm going to be loyal to that job, right? I'm going to be loyal to that paycheck, to that king, um, because I know if I don't have this job because I, you know, lie, cheat, or steal, you know, one, I'd probably get in a lot of trouble, but uh, two, I don't have something better to fall back on, like if I was a noble or something, right? So anyway, um, as far as the average person goes, thinking about the psychology that would make you accept an absolute monarchy, which is something, you know, maybe we're, uh, you know, we see, see ourselves as naturally opposed to. But if you are somebody who lives through this kind of never-ending power struggle between monarch and noble, uh, and there's wars and famine and all these and food price hikes and everything else, at some point you get kind of sick of it, right? At some point you say, I would uh, just like one strong central leader. And yeah, maybe we get a bad one every once in a while, but at least I'm not dealing with civil war every 15 years. Um, so thinking about Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan, right? Thomas Hobbes believing in a strong central authority being the most peaceful possible society. And he talks about how humans are just naturally going to fight over power if it's available. And when he writes Leviathan, he compares a human society to a body, to a human body, and makes the comparison of just like a human body would not cut off its own head, because obviously that would result in you dying, a society shouldn't cut off its own head or depose a monarch, right? Or to kill a monarch, because when the head is cut off, uh, the body will soon die. Because it has, again, um, if humans are naturally going to compete over any of that power, then violence and war become uh, unavoidable or unavoidable if you're Thomas Hobbes. So more examples of Louis XIV being an absolutist, right? He's going to revoke the Edict of Nantes, um, revokes the freedom of worship for Huguenots or French Calvinists, and revokes those uh, certain civil rights they were granted. And, you know, again, if you're an absolutist, it kind of uh, flies in the face of that definition if you allow people to have a religion that is different than you. So uh, Louis XIV, one king, one law, one faith, I am the state, 
And you are going to have the same faith that I have. You are going to follow the laws that I have uh, imposed on you, right? Because I am the king of France and I dictate what happens. And so abs with absolutism becomes religious conformity. Another example, Peter the Great, uh, the modernizer of Russia, right? Where he is going to, you know, tour Western Europe, see those capitals build St. Petersburg or construct St. Petersburg uh, forcibly, right, with slave labor um, to mirror those Western cities. Because he sees that if Russia does not modernize, uh, you know, defeat is inevitable. So that theme of Russian history, right, them kind of falling behind and then being forced uh, to catch up by whoever their leader is at that given time. And so it's not just technologically, right, it's, it's culturally as well. So things like the beard tax, the robe tax, um, forcing those nobles to cut their beards and to wear pants in the Western style, right? Um, and if they don't want to do it, they're going to be punished in some way, or they're going to be taxed heavily. All right, um, the last little bit, comparison in the age of absolutism and constitutionalism. And I didn't put 3.8, but that's 3.8. So if you see the word comparison, that historical thinking skill, right? Don't just look at it as only comparing uh, similarities, right? It's implied that if you compare things, you are contrasting them and showing differences as well, right? So don't just look at it one side of the thing here. But mainly, you know, thinking about the different types of governments you have. You have absolute monarchies and, of course, France, uh, Russia with Peter the Great, Spain with the Phillips. You have, of course, constitutional monarchy in England, especially after the Glorious Revolution when it's confirmed uh, this is what Parliament can do and this is what the King can do. And then that example of uh, monarchical Republican government in the Netherlands, okay? Um, like usual, right? I don't think we're doing this, or I hope we're not doing this, but not relying just on me uh, flying through these topics in history very quickly, but just kind of going through these. And if you see a weak point or you see something, you're like, man, I am not familiar with that idea or concept, uh, taking it upon yourself for the next handful of you know, we still got a few weeks uh, to make sure you are averse in that, well-versed, not averse, well-versed on that topic, right? Okay, guys, I will see you next time.